Good morning or good afternoon, depending upon your time zone. I'm Steve Atticott. I'm a Vice President here at Cavion. I'm very pleased to be joined by two esteemed colleagues. We've got Dave Foster, Cavion's CEO and Chairman. And we also have a very close friend of the house, John Olson. John is President and Founder of Olson Educational Measurement and Assessment Services. He also joins Cavion on many of our consulting engagements um, and focuses, based on his career, uh, in the state assessment arena, although he's a jack of many trades and, and, and helps us in other things as well. Um, what I wanted to do, what we wanted to do was cover some key takeaways, some lessons learned from two important industry events that occurred in the last few weeks. First, TCSSO's National Conference on Student Assessment. Uh, my colleague, John Tremer, who's unable to join us today, he's actually backpacking in the White Mountains of New Hampshire with his kids at the age of 75, so love that. But John was involved in two security sessions at the conference, and he had some key takeaways. And then John Olson's organization has conducted very exhaustive surveys of state assessment programs and state assessment directors the last two years. And the implications from that research on test security are important. So we've asked John to share some of those. After we conclude that piece, we're going to shift gears. And Dave Foster, who uh, has served on the ITC, the International Test Commission Council, for 10 years, is going to share some really important lessons from, well, there are new guidelines that have been adopted by ITC, and they've presented a dynamite keynote on technology at the conference. Uh, and finally, I presented with Eugene Burke of FHL, or CDB, and Ada Wu of NCSBN, a session on the future of tech security. And there's one primary takeaway that I want to be sure to convey from that session. So without further ado, we'll get cracking. And uh, we're just curious of the folks out there who may have attended either of these conferences. So you should see a poll question out there. And if you would just take a moment to answer if you were able to attend one, the other, both or neither. Okay, Steve, it looks like we have 72, 73% voting already. So we'll give them just a couple more seconds and then we'll go ahead and close the poll. Excellent. Thank you, Rochelle. Sure. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. We're getting close to 100% here. Nice. And can you see those results, Steve? You know, I am not able to. What does okay. it indicate, please? Yeah, I, I usually can't when I run the slides either. So um, it looks like about 90% of our attendees today did not attend either conference, and 5% five, 5 each attended NCSA or ITC, and nobody attended both. So this okay. should be a really helpful session for a lot of people today. Great. Well, then let's close that up, and we'll get going. Um, it was really evident, well, so, so NCSA, CCSSO is the Council of Chief State School Officers. These are the most senior state leaders in education in our country. Every year they and their staffs gather to really hone the direction of K-12 assessment. So this year's conference, uh, and, and I think this is probably the 30th year, John Olson would probably know, but um, this year's conference took place in New Orleans, so there was great food, there was great music, but most importantly, really great content in an area that is undergoing incredible change. So that's, that's the, the, the first theme or the first takeaway is, holy smokes, it's not just the breadth of change in K-12 assessment in the U.S., the speed 
is absolutely breathtaking. There is so much change happening so fast. It's really a matter of hang on to your seats, kids, because the, the ride is wild. Now, a big part of that stems from the Common Core. Now, the Common Core was an effort initiated by governors and state chiefs to elevate countrywide the standards against which our kids are educated and tested. And what's really interesting, in recent months, the Common Core has become an incredibly hot potato politically. And where there was great unity, everyone's saying, okay, here's where we're going to go. Now we're seeing administrative sides of government, actual governors and legislatures opting out of Common Core for a number of different political reasons. Now, that has a tremendous amount of fallout on what we call the assessment consortium, which are these groups of states that have banded together because if we all are sharing the same standards, the common core, why don't we band together and create one bigger, better assessment? So that's how the assessment consortium were formed, groups of states coming together to build better tech against the Common Core, but now with states opting out, assessment consortium memberships are opting out, and there's just a huge amount of flux and change. And you couple that with dollars being dangled by the federal government for states to incorporate, uh, for, for states to incorporate teacher accountability or use these assessment, assessments for measuring the performance of teachers and the bottom line is there's a huge amount of change. No one knows where the dust is going to settle in six months, 12 months, 18 months, and um, the stakes keep ratcheting up higher. So, so that's the overarching takeaway or theme from the conference. Um, another primary takeaway is make no mistake, technology delivered tests are here, and they are here to stay. Now, that may not be a surprise to our certification and licensure folks on this webinar, but remember, K-12, it's been paper and pencil for decades. It's always been about test booklets and answer sheets and scanners. And this move to technology is terrific in a number of ways. Most importantly, we're not going to have sensitive, confidential test materials sitting around in schools and districts for weeks. So things like the erasure parties we saw in the Atlantic public school cheating scandal can't happen. And we're able to deploy and design tests in innovative ways, making use of linear on the fly and computer adaptive tests that really heighten the security of the exams and improve uh, our ability to achieve trustworthy test results. Unfortunately, there's a downside. Um, in many cases, the kids taking the test with these different technologies are more familiar than the proctors and administrators. And anytime there's something new and something's unfamiliar, there's potential for new vulnerabilities. But I think the biggest thing is that the infrastructure challenges, limited power, limited number of computers, constrained bandwidth, the need for strong tech support means we can't test as many kids as quickly. So we've got longer test windows. A test administration that may have been a couple of days now may last weeks. And with the assessment consortia, one test may be administered not only for weeks but across multiple times. So the opportunity for piracy and for people to gain access to pirated content and gain unfair advantage is expanded. So this is something from a security standpoint we're all going to be grappling with. And the last thing uh, that I think is really important is that the, the test security conversation at NCSA continues to grow. Now, a couple of days before the conference, there was a gathering of state assessment folks in what's called a SCAF. So I'm going to throw a bunch of uh, 
acronym that you are SCAP, is a state collaborative on assessment and student standards. One of the SCAP is, is TULSA, Technical Innovations in Large Scale Assessment. Now, at the TULSA SCAP meetings, there was a work group created specifically around test security. John Olson was part of that, and I asked John, can you please share some of our highlights from that work group meeting? Uh, sure, I'd be glad to, Steve. Um, first of all, um, give you a little context. The TELSA Test Security Work Group was formed two years ago because this test security topic had become so hot in states, and states wanted to, to work together to see what they could do uh, um, to be better informed and better prepared uh, and, and make improvements to um, their assessment programs and to enhance test security. So John Framer and I led the first test security work group and a year ago uh, published uh, uh, via CCSSO uh, a report called um, Test Security Guidebook for States. So that has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, we'll mention it a little later in our uh, webinar today. At the meeting um, just last month, the test security work group got back together, discussed what would be good as a follow-up to the uh, guidebook, and the states agreed that two new projects would be undertaken. Uh, one was a direct follow-up uh, to the guidebook. You could call it a supplement or um, a second um, follow-up version, let's say. It's going to focus on lessons learned uh, that um, states are experiencing to improve their test security, uh, and it will include a lot of uh, different recommendations and guidance on what states can do to enhance um, their um, procedures to prevent and detect uh, irregularities or cheating. Uh, so John Freemer and I will be working on this second um, lessons learned report um, with the TILSA group. Another project is also started up and it's going to focus on data forensics and quantitative analyses, uh, primarily cheating detection methods and group level aberrants. Um, and that will be headed up by uh, uh, Billy Skorupski. Um, and so these two projects will continue on. Uh, certainly the work group had a, li a lively discussion and, and even more certainly test security continues to be a major, major issue in states. Thank you very Steve, much, back John. to you. You're welcome. Okay. So um, the focus of the TOPA SCAS is indicative of, of how test security is, in, is an important priority. Also, um, the number of sessions regarding test security continues to increase at NCSA. It was only two years ago that in this very webinar, I commented on what I considered the dearth of conversation on this important topic. But then last year, there were at least two very, very useful informative sessions. Uh, and this year, there were several, including these three. Now, my colleague John Freemer was involved in the first one, balancing test security and accessibility on next generation online assessments. Um, there was a session on system, systematizing and improving test security. And the last one was sort of an all-star cast with uh, Greg Sizek from University of North Carolina, Wanda Brock from West Virginia, Angela Hemingway from the state of Idaho Department, <coughs> excuse me, Department of Education, and again, John Freeman, on preventing and detecting cheating in statewide assessments. So it's excellent to see these very useful sessions giving really good advice. And, and let's talk about some of that. So um, John Freeman kind of distilled some of the, the, the key messages from these three. And I want to quickly share them with you. Now, the days of waiting on the sidelines and just sort of hoping that something bad doesn't happen in a high-stakes test administration, those days are gone. It's critical, based upon what was shared, for the state to be proactive, get ahead of the curve. And that means you've got to institute the right policies and procedures and 
make sure your policies and procedures are as drum tight as sound as they possibly can be, which refers to that second item, conducting a comprehensive security audit of policies and procedures. With so much being invested in test development, uh, let's do everything we can with those policies and procedures to protect our test development investments. And part of that is by continually improving uh, the training and the level of monitoring conducted at the district and classroom level. So several states commented on their use of statistical analyses, data forensics, as a means of measuring threats and risks to trustworthy results so that they're better able to manage against those threats and risks. And when you do find something amiss, if you've got a test security handbook that lays out the security incident response plan, how you will follow up on any irregularity, um, that's a much better position to be in than kind of on your heels, not quite sure what to do. So the test security handbook and having policies and procedures for investigation are, are critical. This ninth point is my favorite. And I first was attuned to this last year at this very conference when Greg Sizes talked about, you know what? We're not looking for cheaters. This isn't about cheating. This is a validity issue. So let's do everything we can to ensure we have valid, trustworthy test results. And to do that, it used to be that anyone trying to be proactive and out front and, 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 and build a handbook was really sort of feeling their way out in the wilderness on their own. But now we've got this amazing intersection where in the last two years, different groups have developed different standards, guidelines, and resources to help us all. And we just want to highlight some of these. Uh, a year and a half ago, NCME released a white paper, that's the National Council of Measurement and Education, on testing and data integrity in the administration of statewide student assessment programs. This can be downloaded from the internet. It's very useful. This second resource, folks, John, John Olson just talked about this. A work group of state assessment directors gathered materials together for a workbook. It's, it's just chock block full of tools you can use to help build a security handbook, to in, institute a security incident response plan, to conduct an investigation. It's available for free through PDF. If you want the bound published version, it's four bucks. I use mine every single day. It's dynamite. We saw the release of the Handbook of Test Security. This was edited by University of Wisconsin and Madison, Jim Wallach, Jim's a very esteemed measurement expert, serves on the board of NCME. Also edited by John Freema. Um, every chapter focuses on a particular test security issue. Every chapter is authored by an expert in that topic area. This has become the go-to resource, the go-to Bible for test security. Uh, TCFSO and ATP banded together several years ago and released operational best practices for large-scale assessment. Now that was focused on paper and pencil. My colleague Dave Foster authored the chapter on security for the rewrite of the operational best practices that are focused on technology delivered assessment. Um, the National Center of Educational Outcomes has issued test security in students with disabilities and analysis of state security policies. And then there are also now, well, we are understood they are to be released this month. I don't think they have them yet. But uh, new standards for education and psychological testing this will have a renewed focus on tech security. So when we really used to be wandering in the dark, we now have excellent resources to help us all deal with these increased risks and challenges regarding trustworthy testing. So 
those were our takeaways from NCSA. And uh, now I want to turn things over to John Olson to talk about his session involving an exhaustive survey. All right, thank you, Steve. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to uh, uh, provide this information to everybody on this webinar. And um, it was a good session at the conference, and I'm not saying that just because I proposed and organized it, but uh, it was very well attended, and the information that was shared uh, covered a lot of ground. Um, and, and I'll describe uh, some highlights from that. The session uh, included, besides uh, uh, myself serving as chair, Barry Topol, who's the managing partner at Assessment Solutions Group, and also is an expert on assessment costing. Uh, Juan de Brott, uh, formerly from West Virginia, West Virginia. Uh, he's left the position just recently. Roger Irvin from Kentucky Department of Education and John Weiss with the Pennsylvania Department of Education. So we had the three states and, and two others, uh, which was Barry and I who actually um, conducted this survey and collected all the data. So next slide. An overview of uh, what our focus was during the session. Uh, first, we provided some context uh, on this uh, annual state assessment survey, which was started in 2012, mainly because um, we wanted to collect information on what states were doing and what they were planning to do when the big year 2014-15 comes up. Um, in relation to the consortia they were in, or were they doing their own state assessments, or what exactly were their plans. Last year, we conducted a second round of surveys, had 42 states participate, uh, which was a pretty good increase from the first year, um, a different collection of questions, data that, that were collected, and uh, uh, then we share the, the data with the states. Um, we think this is a good resource, especially to state assessment staff, because they uh, can find out in, in one big database what other states are doing as they plan and prepare for 2014-15. And this has become quite a moving target uh, with changes every year, too, so that we plan to continue the survey into the future. So what information was collected in this survey? Uh, next slide. In 2013, we uh, looked at these um, six or seven main topics. Uh, one was definitely the, the plans for um, the coming year, years. Uh, second one was funding costs, state budgets for their current assessment components. And that's every component in their assessment program, um, from summative to formative interim, alternate assessments, and ELP tests but also looking at funding budget issues for future plans, because that is becoming an increasing issue. We surveyed uh, what states were doing on the topic of technology, especially computer-based testing, uh, asked them about their plans for sustainability of assessments, in other words, continuing whatever they do in 2015 into the foreseeable future. Because test security issues had become so uh, hot and so important, we added in and, and surveyed a number of uh, issues pertaining to that, which I'll describe um, in my talk. And then uh, an assortment of other issues, too, on, uh, on assessment plans, uh, including what they're going to be doing about next generation science. So the session, uh, we had over 100 people. It was a standing room only crowd. In fact, if CCSSO had given us a larger room, I'm sure we could have uh, possibly failed that too because people were being turned away at the door when they couldn't find seats. Um, so there's a lot of interest in this uh, and a lot of people from states, from test publishers, others uh, were in the audience. Okay, um, let me talk about some of the highlights from the survey and uh, the information presented in this session. Uh, number one topic was on technology implementation. States, as they responded to the survey questions, uh, told us specifically uh, this is a concern, technology readiness uh, continued to be a concern, although they seem to be 
feeling a little more comfortable than they did in the 2012 survey. Um, but it was still the number one topic. Number two topic of concern in states was their costs and budgets for assessments, especially new ones that might cost more than current ones. When we asked them, were you committed to staying in the consortium, uh, or were you looking at other possibilities or options, most, or not, let's not say most, many states said they were fully committed to the consortium which is a little bit different thing than we had heard the year before. But when we asked them if they had a plan B, uh, states were saying, well, I guess we better have one. And most of them said they would continue their current state assessment, uh, maybe make some changes to align it to common core state standards, um, and they would uh, possibly extend their current contracts for a year to continue with that. Now, remember, this data were collected in spring summer of last year. We know things have changed since then. Okay, uh, the topic of test security, uh, when we um, uh, queried states on that, um, most states said yes, it was becoming uh, more and more of a big issue and concern, and they were taking steps to uh, improve their policies, procedures, practice on test security. They also um, we're pleased that there were a number of new documents, reports, and, and resources that they could uh, lean on to help. And those were described in Steve's talk, so I won't go through them. But uh, uh, they certainly were aware that there was uh, becoming more and more resources and things that uh, that really would be helpful. Okay, next slide. Okay, among the summary and conclusions that were presented in this session, um, and then. Um, also in the survey itself, um, there was some mention of anti-Common Core backlash and states dropping out of consortia and just a number of different, very mostly political issues going on that state assessment staff had no control on. It was typically state legislatures uh, that were, or even sometimes the governor, that were um, uh, being anti-Common Core. Uh, so just in the course of the of the past year, there's been quite a few more states who have dropped out of being in either Smarter, Balanced, or Park. Um, other states uh, and the drop and the states that have dropped out were looking at well, what are the other options? And so they were looking and they were telling us that they've been approached by other vendors and looking at there might be some other things that the states could use. I don't think there's any firm commitment. Um, but whatever they use, they want rigor, they want reasonable cost, and I think most state people think the consortia were the best uh, alternative at the moment. Okay, next one. Um, on the online assessment front, states are saying um, any new assessment or even current ones they were moving towards online so uh, the goal was to go all online uh, some states of course are there um, we found that two-thirds of the states are doing something online uh, some everything others uh, a component or two um, states did express that technology um, um, computer delivered tests were still a concern uh, they weren't getting the funding that was necessary to build up the infrastructure. Oops, hang on, I'm sorry. My screen just uh, went away. I got it back. Um, and there was some concern about uh, states pay attention to one another very closely about the experience some states were having and challenges in um, delivering um, online and without having problems. And there were a, a number of problems that had happened last year that uh, uh, either happen in states we surveyed or other states were saying, oh, we, I hope that doesn't happen here. So um, um, there's, there's definitely still some concern um, in all of this. All right, one more slide maybe. Um, states continue to like getting data on costs, see where they stand, uh, and the different breakdowns, and, and uh, like I said earlier, they, um, um, they're hoping to have cost savings or at least get the biggest bang, bang for their bucks on whatever assessment they use in um, 
the coming year. Um, the, um, as I had mentioned, we're going to be starting another survey uh, very soon, in fact. Uh, so if there's any states on the webinar, uh, you've probably already been contacted by, um, by us. Um, our state representatives that were in the session, they, they actually provided a lot of very valuable information and data from their state perspective from inside the Department of Education on what was going on with their assessments. Um, sometimes it was politics changes, uh, initiatives, whatever, that were um, having them go in a, a different direction than originally planned. Other times it was refinement of things. Certainly uh, the focus was on standards and professional developments, uh, uh, making sure assessments are aligned and ready to go in the coming years, um, the technology challenges, costs, politics uh, came up many, many times and um, at least two of the three states that, that uh, were in this session talked about test security issues and how they were uh, addressing them head on. So um, like I said before, states are definitely aware um, and, and taking steps to uh, uh, deal with uh, problems either existing or potential. And then one last thing, at the end of the session, uh, it, there was a lively Q&A time where um, uh, members of the audience just wanted to find out more about either specific things in the state or about overall um, data um, results from the survey. So I think it was a good one uh, and, and a lot of information was shared. Let me mention one other thing to everybody. Um, all of the presentations from this session as well as most other sessions at the conference can be found at the CCSSO website. Uh, they're all uploaded there and um, so if you wanted to find out more about uh, this specific session that I'm talking about or any other ones that Steve uh, has mentioned, um, just go to the CCSSO website and look under the conference and uh, you know, you'll have a good link to a ton of information. That's a great tip, John. Thank you very much. So uh, that uh, draws to a close our, our conversation on the NCSA, the National Conference on Student Assessment. Does anyone have any questions for John Olson or for me about that conference? Please use, please use your little dashboard, uh, your GoToMeeting dashboard, and we're happy to take those or at the end. Um, if not, then let's dive into the ninth biannual, every other year, International Test Commission Conference. This year's conference took place in San Sebastian, Spain, a part of the world I had never visited. Kind of tough to get to, but holy smoke, absolutely beautiful, amazing food. And um, as I said, my colleague Dave Foster has been on the part of the leadership of ITC for a number of years. So Dave, tell us about the conference. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. Can you hear me okay? Just fine. Thanks. Yeah, uh, it, was, it was a great conference. As you can imagine, it drew a very diverse audience from all over the world. Um, on the, even on the council itself, there are members, it's a 12-member council, has members from 10 different countries. So it's a bit of a unique so what, what, why I've been involved and why it's so important to me is because um, the issues we deal with, or I deal with in the United States, are very similar to what is being dealt with in Europe or Asia or South America. Um, and it's nice to see that those issues are covered well in a conference like this and in other materials provided by the International Test Commission. Uh, more and more testing programs are providing tests across borders, across cultures, even if within the U.S. Um, we, we deal with many cultures and many languages um, in, our, in our testing programs and the International Test Commission provides some of that. Some very good advice, they have a, a number of guidelines. Which, which brings me to my first topic is a brand new set of guidelines that were re, uh, re released, well at least approved by the council and I believe they're on the website now. Uh, here's the, here is a um, 
a link on this page where you can get it. This adds to the list of resources that Steve, that Steve and both John both talked about. Uh, I think it's a great companion set of guidelines and best practices organized probably a little bit differently. <laughs> As this says, there are 116 guidelines covered in three areas, planning for security, um, and then actually administering or implementing uh, security methods. And then uh, the last section is what, what happens, what should you do when there's a breach. Um, so the very useful set of guidelines. Let me, uh, let's go to the next slide. What I'm going to show here are some, ex just, just three or four examples, not, not many, just to show you kind of the level of of uh, wording that exists in each of them. This is in the in the first section on security planning. Uh, this is the fifth guideline of 21, and this simply states security rules should be indicated clearly in the security plan and communicated to all interested parties. Consequences for violations of these rules should be clear. Well, you would you would think that you know, guidelines are usually pretty common sense. Um, uh, there are a number of programs that that don't do doesn't that don't do this very well, and so this kind of guideline would be very helpful. So let's let's show another example. Um, this is um, this is from it says security planning guideline, but it's actually one of the security implementation guidelines. Uh, there are 73 of those. Uh, this is number 18G. Uh, this talks about Proctors or invigilators, uh, they should not have an interest or stake in the test outcome. They should not be instructors or teachers for test takers, nor familiar with the content covered by a test. Uh, I, I'm sure you know that the issues in the state assessments, uh, security issues that John and Steve just talked about, had, uh, should this guideline be adhered to, teachers would have uh, no role in, um, in, in administration of the exam and therefore uh, would not be tempted by or be uh, prevented actually from from uh, manipulating the, the results that we've seen in uh, quite a few state scandals, cheating scandals. Uh, Steve, the next one. This one is uh, uh, having one to do with responding to a breach. This is guideline number four in that section out of 22. Uh, this simply states that scores shown to be inaccurate as a result of test fraud should be canceled or invalidated. This is a tough, a tough step to take. I've seen so many programs simply refuse or be are unable to cancel a test score uh, once it has been um, <laughs> completed. Once the test is completed and scored, uh, that that particular test score, even though it may not have any validity at all, uh, remains on the books and influences um, decision making. So again, a very, all of them are similar to these three that you have seen, um, and, and I think it's uh, well worth uh, the time it takes to get those, uh, download them and review them with, uh, you know, by yourself or with staff or friends or colleagues. Next slide, please. Um, after the guideline piece, I, w um, I was asked to do a keynote address on the current and future effects of technology on testing. Technology has been a love of mine in this industry for since 1982 um, when we created the first adaptive test in a, in a K-12 program. Uh, it w and, and so I was asked to present, and now notice the focus, the current that is what, what, how we're using technology today, and then where, how might technology affect testing in the future. So basically, I, I pulled out of this keynote those pieces uh, that had to do with security. Rather, uh, it's a much broader topic on testing in general, so I'll just point out a few things. First, I, I presented, uh, next slide please, Steve. I, um, I presented a top 10 countdown of current technology use and my criteria, first of all, uh, the technology has to be available and has to be used by at least some testing programs. <clears throat> and um, of the top ten, uh, three, of the, uh, three of the top four were security related. And so I'm going to present those uh, right now. So uh, the four, number four 
in the countdown I, ref, I call uh, is called online proctoring. That is the ability for proctors to exist at some uh, and, and to and to monitor the exam online through webcams and other pieces of technology to authenticate using um, a variety of, of biometric either devices or software that allows them to make sure the test taker is the one. So this is a great technology. <clears throat> There's no doubt it's going to continue to um, proliferate. It's going to get better. If done properly today, in my opinion, it's probably as good as um, almost all proctoring that occurs by end of humans in, in, a, in a room with test takers. So it's got great promise. So I've, I've, I've ranked it at number four. So number three is the um, science of, of uh, forensic analysis of test result data. It's called data forensics, uh, the ability to see patterns of abnormality, or not just abnormality, downright cheating or theft of, of test content and their effects. Um, uh, th this has been um, pioneered by many, many different organizations. Um, uh, you probably have heard or read some of these reports, but it's figuring prominently in investigations of, of fraud and, and, and quite a number of high-stakes testing programs. So uh, I look forward to many more and continuing improvement, but the technology is available today. Next, and then uh, number one, which I think is the, is the one with the great promise, the technology is available today to deliver multiple choice questions a different way. Instead of presenting all the options at one time, you present them randomly one at a time. Um, you end the question when a person answers right or wrong, and they answer right or wrong by just, you see the example here, what is this tool used for? To conduct electricity to a light bulb, well that's uh, not the case, so you would say no, uh, and, and you would probably see another option. If you said yes, this question would go away. And uh, the, the security benefit of this kind of question is that it protects the content of the question, making it difficult to steal and to share with others and to use information about it to cheat, especially when the number of options is much larger than the usual four or five. So those were three of the top four, top ten technologies <coughs> that are, are very much related to benefits to security. So. Um, now I want to switch gears just a little bit. Go to the next slide, Steve, and let's just take a little peek at um, at, fu at the future. Um, um, this is a little more speculative because the technologies are not quite there yet to impact testing, but they're certainly on the horizon or even a lot closer than that. Uh, and so I've, I've I've presented a dozen or so. Four of them had to do with security, and those are the ones I'm presenting uh, right now. But I, I want you to keep in mind that technology is a, is a two-edged sword. It can help with our security efforts, but it can also harm uh, us in, in terms of being used by people that would uh, that would break security rules. So let's some of the, two of these are that are, are of the harmful variety, and two are of the helpful variety. So let's let's go through them. The first technology is the use of micro cameras and contact lenses. Um, so you can you can actually record whatever you're looking at. Um, the test taker, in this case, it's a security risk because uh, the test taker can be recording the content of the test and be completely uh, undetectable by any by any proctor or online or offline. Um, so the effect of this is better cheating, more effective cheating, and it's quite plausible. I think these are available today. I don't know when widespread use will be, but it's probably a couple of years away before test takers begin using this in um, high stakes exams. Next one. There will be more, um, hit the click one more time, there'll be more secure test and item designs. Uh, testing programs are coming in uh, coming up with with ways to protect the tests and the uh, test questions 
better than before. Obviously, with that first thread of that little camera on the contact lens, you, we have to protect our test content better than ever before. Uh, I think that uh, changing the way we actually design and, de and deliver our items and our tests will lead to actual cheat-proof tests. You can't cheat on them. I think that technology is coming, uh, will be plausible, and um, I, I estimate about five years away. That's going to change the security landscape. Monitoring technology, we, we've probably heard the debates of uh, Big Brother watching us and how many cameras we pass by in a day on a city street. Um, people watching through our smartphones, watching us through our smartphones and laptops. You know, monitoring technology is getting more ubiquitous and more effective. Um, and so we should be able to, this is, uh, so the next uh, graphic on that, please. This should lead to, I think, proctoring that will move away from human effort and be automated completely. Um, so our proctoring will, will go away from the, um, sometimes the risk involved using a human proctor as well as the inconsistency of that proctoring and make it entirely automated. I, I placed this particular effect about five years away as well. Okay, next slide. Okay, this one, uh, printing technology is, you all know about 3D printers and what they're able to do. Uh, but there are, uh, you know, printers themselves are amazing in what they can, are beginning to produce. This particular graphic shows a driver's license being printed. A, a copy, a type of printer that can do that is shown in the other graphic. Um, these will fool even uh, you know some of the best scanning systems and training systems for people that check ID that exist. They look virtually indistinguishable from real IDs, uh, which means that it would be very it's going to be very difficult to stop people from t taking the test who shouldn't be taking the test. These are undetectable fake IDs, and if the testing program relies on identifying a person by a government-issued identification. Um, this is going to undermine that capability. And this is, uh, this, these are being sold today. They're, on the web, they're called novelty IDs. Um, but they just simply are fake IDs that have tremendous potential for damage. And I, uh, this is closer than the others. I expect uh, people will start using that fairly soon. Okay, next. Um, so moving away from that keynote, um, there was a session I chaired uh, with three very interesting presentations on investigations. Investigating is not something we've talked about. It's only been a recent conversation uh, having to do with something that's really cheating, but responding to a breach requires you to investigate at probably levels that you're either unfamiliar with or unprepared to do. Um, so these particular, these, all three of these uh, papers uh, talk about um, investigations, uh, preparing for them, how to use statistics as part of an investigation, and how to conduct it. So I've just taken a, one or two quotes from each of these individuals. The first one by John Freemer, colleague at Cavian, and the second by Ardashir Garampaya of University of Cambridge, and the third Mark Weinstein from Dilworth Paxton, uh, Paxton Law Firm. So from John, he wanted to stress in this session that the basic goal of an investigation is not to punish people. It is to establish the validity of the scores. Can they all be trusted? That is all the scores. Uh, which ones can be trusted? And to gather the de details and evidence to support the, the decisions about test scores. Along the way, you will, you will want to know who is responsible, and that information will be captured as well. But the whole point of an investigation is to determine how much of your testing uh, remains, remains valid and useful. Next one, please. Uh, from uh, Dr. Garampaya from the University of Cambridge uh, made a couple of great points, which I think we tend to forget at times. Um, when cheating, cheating is not a victimless crime. Uh, when it occurs, honestly obtained test results lose credibility. Whatever they're trying to achieve becomes devalued. And so 
um, if it's allowed to continue, um, the whole the whole point and purpose of testing is frustrated. Um, and he also makes a statement that uh, once cheating is detected, uh, you have to, you obligated responsible to put in place efforts to stop the use of test results that aren't valid that aren't useful. And we talked about canceling such such scores, and then to deter future cheaters, make make your system a little stronger. Um, okay, next. Next uh, slide, please. Hold on. Just... Sorry about that. The third was from. Next one is from Mark Weinstein of Dilworth Paxton. Ah, this is. Um... I'm going to go offline. Hold on a second. I apologize for that. Um, Mark Weinstein of Dilworth Paxson uh, uh, is an is a, a individual who goes in and interviews folks as part of the investigation. And he, he wants to point out that you need to um, investigate face-to-face -face. Um, and um, let's go to the next slide. He makes the point that invest interviews must be conducted in person. He says the only hope you have of assessing the truthfulness of a statement, looking the person in the eye and watching his or her body language. Nonverbal communication is the key. We don't do a lot of this type of investigation, but I think it's, it's going, to, going to become more and more uh, used in, in, in what we do. So I think, Steve, that comes to the end of my slides. And I think I'll turn the time back to you. That's what I learned from ITC, a very useful conference. Terrific. And I just wanted to highlight one last thing. I was part of a session in a decade of test security, the past and the future. Um, I presented with Eugene Burke in addition to, well, Eugene is just one of the wackiest folks in our industry, and in addition to being one of the more brilliant. Um, Ada Wu is one of the most senior psychometricians at the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. And each shared very important nuggets of information around pet security. But what I really wanted to leave everyone with is this model instituted by NCFPN of the test score validity triangle. And according to Phil Dickinson of NCSDN, it used to be we'd, we'd consider a score valid when there was a quality test, the content was good, and it was psychometrically sound. And that's how we did it for a long, long time. But at NCSDN, it's changed. It's evolved to where there is this third aspect where for the score to be considered valid, Yes, it's got to be good con content, quality test, psychometrically sound. But we need to be confident in the security of the testing. If there's anything that makes us suspicious or curious around the security of that exam, we won't consider it a valid test result. So I mentioned kind of this concept earlier as presented by Greg Sizek a year ago at NCSA. I love seeing a year later how it's evolved. And really, this conversation is permeating so much of the assessment industry. Psychometrics, quality tests, and strong security are what's required for us to realize valid test results. So that's all we have for you today. And I hope this has been useful. I want to thank our two panelists, uh, Dave and John. If there are any questions out there, we're happy to field them. Um, if not, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. I don't see any questions. Well, thank you all very much. Here's a question.
sorry. Um, can you see the question, Steve, or would you like me to read it? I can see it, but I don't know what it was relating to. It says, when you say two-thirds are using technology, to what extent? So I don't know. Whoever asked that question, if you could clarify that a little bit, please. Uh, Steve, this is John. I think that was that one uh, uh, item of data that I had in my talk from our survey. And we didn't probe them on to the extent of using technology. We just asked them, are you using uh, it primarily, again, focused on um, whether they were doing uh, any sort of computer-based testing. Um, and sometimes states would expand, as we were talking with them on the survey, and other times it was kind of minimal. So I'm sorry we don't have uh, uh, the extent of it, but maybe that's something we'll uh, add into our, our next survey, get a little more detail on that from states. OK. Um, so there's another question, John. With some of the states that were having some challenges as technology challenges when they went um, implemented more widely. What were some of those problems that states encountered? Are you familiar enough to speak to that? John O? I'm sorry. Steve, I, was, uh, I knew it would happen sooner or later. I was muted exactly. and talking. Um, yeah. <laughs> almost, I almost made it to the end. Um, I didn't hear the complete question, something about technology challenges. Uh, so in the survey results you shared, you indicated that some states that had uh, implemented online testing more widely had some challenges. I think Oklahoma was one of those perhaps mentioned. And the question was, what kind of issues are the states seeing when they deploy online testing more widely? Okay, yeah, that was, uh, that was certainly a concern. Uh, there were big, where, where there were big challenges and big interruptions or smaller ones, um, um, the big ones are the ones that get all the attention. And, and those were basically um, uh, crashes of servers, uh, basically the whole entire testing session, uh, not in just a classroom or a school, but across lots of schools, if not the entire state, would suddenly, um, it just wasn't being delivered anymore. And, and yes, that happened uh, in Oklahoma and Indiana. Minnesota had some problems, Kentucky, um, others. So that typically um, seems to be what states are encountering when they start doing massive amounts of testing. Um, you know, where a lot of uh, schools, a lot of kids all of a sudden are all connecting in uh, all at once. And so whether it's bandwidth problems or um, server connection problems or something else, um, uh, that's usually a wake-up call that uh, the system's not quite ready for prime time. That's, uh, you know, it, it, it's got to be hard to replicate that kind of scale when you know you, you do some field testing and you do some uh, virtual uh, uh, scaling of the computer system but they have thousands of kids all accessing the servers at the same time um, anyway I think that about wraps it up we're pushing up on the hour we're over the hour we always try to keep these at 60 minutes or less so to our panelists, Dave and John, I thank you very much. To our participants, thank you all very much. And uh, please check us out next month. It's going to be a really, really interesting session on uh, kind of new ways to generate cut scores. Thank you.